806 here on AM 760 Progressive Talk. All right, let's gong them in. Here we are. Uh, the AM 760 Progressive Dojo is open. Joining us in studio uh, is Colorado Attorney General John Southers uh, and uh, Democrat, his Democratic challenger in the upcoming election, Stan Garnett, who is the uh, district attorney up in Boulder County. Uh, we've solicited your questions uh, for uh, these two candidates in the upcoming uh, attorney general's race. Uh, it is going to be, I'm guessing, as uh, as seriously contested a race as all of the other political races in this state uh, are. And just before we get to this discussion, um, and it's going to be a free-flowing uh, discussion, I just want to remind folks what the attorney general, at, what the attorney general's office actually is, because I think some of us get confused about what it is, and this is right off the attorney general's website. The attorney general has primary authority for enforcement of consumer protection and antitrust laws, prosecution of criminal appeals, and some complex white-collar crimes. The AG's office also works uh, with Colorado's district attorneys and other local, state, and federal law enforcement authorities. Uh, the AG is also the chief legal counsel and advisor to the executive branch of the state government, including the uh, the governor, uh, also the uh, AG uh, also lobbies the state legislature uh, as well. Uh, thank you both uh, for being here in studio with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks Glad for having here, us. Yeah. Uh, let's start uh, in the issue that we've gotten a lot of email on, and I promise we're going to get to many, many issues. But I, I'm guessing you know that uh, that that one of the top issues that people are concerned about or interested in, at least, is the marijuana issue. Uh, and I just want to start right there because we got a lot of email about this. And this question is for uh, for you, Attorney General Southers. Uh, you told uh, the Mountain Mail out in Salida, uh, the newspaper out there, that you, quote, suspect 80 percent of local governments are going to choose to not allow medical marijuana dispensaries, which suggests that you think that a city has the legal right uh, to ban medical marijuana. But if the state constitution, uh, as many argue, makes medical marijuana constitutionally legal, aren't such municipal ordinances unconstitutional? Thanks for that question, and thanks for having us on today. Uh, in 2000, and I was part of the debate, I remember it well, the voters of Colorado passed Amendment 20. Amendment 20 was very narrow. It created an affirmative defense to enforcement of the criminal laws uh, of the state of Colorado involving marijuana, against a person who had a debilitating medical condition, as defined in the Constitution, who had a recommendation from a doctor indicating that medical marijuana may help them, uh, and who had in their possession the small amount of marijuana allowed by the Constitution that they grew themselves or that a primary caregiver, who's defined in the Constitution as someone who has uh, significant responsibility for the welfare of the patient, grew for them. Uh, Amendment 20 did not sanction the sale of marijuana. There's a case, uh, People versus Clendenin, in which the uh, Colorado Court of Appeals held that, and the Colorado Supreme Court denied cert. And I just want to read a provision to it. They pointed out, the Court of Appeals pointed out, that in the Blue Book, which explained to the voters what they were voting on in 2000, it says, under state criminal law, it will still be illegal to sell marijuana or marijuana plants to another individual, including a patient on the state reg register. Okay, so, so if I hear you right, you're saying that that – us under the way you read it, the way that you read the amendment in the Constitution, that that it would be not allowed for a municipality to say you can't possess, let's say, medical marijuana, but it is allowed for a, a, a municipality to say uh, you cannot have a dispensary in the municipality. That's exactly right, David. Twenty did not sanction dispensaries, so that debate moved to the legislature, and there was a law enforcement and uh, uh, drug treatment coalition urge the legislature to refer to the voters whether they wanted to sanction dispensaries. The legislature chose, and they acknowledge it's not in the Constitution, they set up a statutory structure uh, for dispensaries. Uh, but they also provided in that statutory structure that local governments, uh, either the governing body themselves, county commissioners or town councils, or the citizens by a vote could opt out. So what I was saying in Salida is I think geographically, and that, and that 80 percent of counties and towns in Colorado will choose to opt out. Uh, Stan Garnett, uh, the Boulder County District Attorney, the uh, Democratic candidate for Attorney General. Uh, if you want to uh, 
respond to that, if you have anything to add uh, to that interpretation, to that view of the Constitution. And I also want to ask you, and I also, uh, Attorney General Southers, I want to get your opinion on this as well. Uh, do you support uh, a proposal uh, that has been talked about uh, to make marijuana legal in this state, not only for medicinal use, but for recreational use? Well, David, first of all, thanks very much for having us on. And John, it's good to be here with you this morning. Uh, and I really appreciate the chance to sit down and answer these questions. And it's great we're getting so many questions from uh, your listeners. I've had a number of folks contact me and say they were very much looking forward to this. Um, first of all, I think it's fair to say that I have a somewhat different view of what Amendment 20 does in Attorney General Southers. Amendment 20 does not specifically address dispensaries, and that's partly due to the limited uh, one subject requirement we have for constitutional amendments in Colorado law. Many people think, and I agree, that uh, dispensaries are implicitly permitted under, the, under Amendment 20, and the legislature has agreed with that by the uh, legislation that they passed. Now, John Southers just mentioned the Clendenin case. The Clendenin case is a case I know very well because it came out of Boulder County. In the Clendenin opinion, the Court of Appeals said the legislature needs to come in and address this issue. The legislature needs to uh, bring some clarity to the issue of how medical marijuana can be dispensed who can have it, and how it can be distributed. The legislature has done that. They have permitted a uh, network and a system of dispensaries. I think it's going to work pretty well. They do reserve in the legislation a right to uh, let uh, local municipalities uh, ban dispensaries entirely if they choose to. I think that's good policy. I think issues like this that are this controversial, that are this difficult, need to be decided on a locale by lo locale basis. I think what we're going to find is that most municipalities and counties end up permitting dispensaries because the complaints that I've heard about medical marijuana, and I was one of the first elected district attorneys to speak publicly about the complexity in this issue, are mainly land use issues. People care a lot about where dispensaries are, what they look like, how close they are to schools, that sort of thing. The same kind of things you hear about with liquor stores and payday loan outfits and pawn, pawn shops, that sort of thing. If we give municipalities and counties the ability to control those issues and control uh, uh, the, the, the way dispensaries uh, appear within the community, I think the communities will accept that. Finally, I think most municipalities and counties are going to want the quite substantial tax revenue that will be generated by dispensaries as they move forward. It's a very interesting issue. I've said in the past that you really couldn't have a more confused legal framework than we've had in Colorado over the last few years on medical marijuana, but I think uh, we'll see it uh, uh, clear up in the near future. And, and on, on this talk about legalization, a ballot initiative to legalize marijuana, uh, where do you stand on that? Well, I've said in the past that I think probably eventually there will be more legalization of marijuana. I would not support a proposal to legalize marijuana uh, at this point. I would need to be satisfied that there was a clear control of, uh, in regulation of uh, um, the distribution of marijuana and an ability to tax it and uh, make sure that we can tr control the impact it has on communities and that we can make sure we keep it away from kids. And, and, and Attorney General Southers on the legalization question. Uh, Dave, I wouldn't support legalization of marijuana, but I've been on the record as saying uh, that I would prefer legalization to the kind of hypocrisy that we're in right now. Uh, we've gone from 1,700 patients on the registry to over 100,000. I think within another year or so, we may, could have as many as 200,000. They're going to be about 75% male. I think the average age when this shakes out is going to be about 24, 25. Uh, a small percentage of them, in, in my opinion, will actually have a debilitating medical condition. We have situations now where dorms at CU have discount arrangements with particular uh, uh, dispensaries and things like that. Uh, that sort of hypocrisy, I think, is unhealthy. I think it's sending the wrong message to children. I'm not sure it sends any... Uh, less of the wrong message than uh, legalization would be. So even though I'm opposed to legalization, I have to say I think we've got pretty close to de facto legalization. I, I, I want to ask one, one follow-up to, to, to both of you because uh, you mentioned the hypocrisy. Do you see a hypocrisy uh, as a matter of, let's say, law enforcement uh, in terms of how we treat alcohol or how we treat prescription drugs uh, versus how we treat marijuana. And, and I'm curious why you think, if you agree that there is a hypocrisy, why you think that exists? Well, I don't think there's a hypocrisy in enforcement. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, possession and use of small amounts of marijuana has been a very low law enforcement priority for a long time. When I was U.S. attorney, uh, our threshold 
uh, for federal involvement was at least 100 plants. We didn't get involved in anything less. Uh, yes, we've had some initiatives on in the, the ballot in uh, Denver to, to, you know, order it to be a low priority. That's fine if that's what the citizens of Denver want to do. I don't think that the police have been spending an inordinate amount of time enforcing those kinds of laws. I do think that alcohol is a tremendous problem in our society, and we shouldn't uh, in any way lose sight of the fact that it's causing more problems for us than probably all uh, illicit drug use combined, and we have to be very diligent in continuing uh, to— But I guess what I'm getting at then, if you can acknowledge that, do you, th as, as the advisor, as a legal advisor to the legislature that deals with whether to legalize certain things, I is there a hypocrisy, or are legislators wrong to say, look— if alcohol is legal, if we as a society say alcohol is legal and you can acknowledge what you've just acknowledged about it, then shouldn't we make marijuana legal? Uh, I don't personally think we, we should. The fact that we have so many problems with alcohol, I don't think we make another uh, mind-altering substance uh, legal and take on all those additional problems. I also remind everybody that uh, there's an awful lot of people in this world that uh, uh, consume alcohol in sub-intoxicating doses, don't drink alcohol to get uh, high. I think everybody acknowledges that you uh, take drugs like marijuana for the purpose of getting high, unless, of course, you're doing it for truly legitimate medicinal reasons. Stan Garnett, do you have a, a response to, to this question about sure. uh, the d discrepancy between alcohol and marijuana policy? Well, David, you're absolutely right. Of course there's hypocrisy about how we deal with alcohol enforcement versus marijuana enforcement. You know, when I took over the Boulder DA's office, I, became, I was very clear with my staff about our enforcement priorities. And the key in law enforcement is what are your priorities? What are you going to put the resources into? And I was very clear. Our, our priorities are violent crime, serious drug dealing, serious economic crime, and public corruption. Serious drug dealing, and I was very clear with my staff, means dealing methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin. Those are the things that ruin lives, ruin communities. Um, John talked about uh, hypocrisy with medical marijuana. I don't know that I'd say we have hypocrisy. We certainly have a very confused situation. But let me make one thing clear because it's important for your listeners to know. The legislature, at uh, uh, the urging of myself and a number of other, of other people in law enforcement and elsewhere, passed Senate Bill 109 last year. That will do a lot to clean up the issue about making sure we actually have a bona fide doctor-patient relationship between the medical marijuana patient and the medical marijuana provider. So I don't think the hypocrisy is quite as bad as John described. I certainly think we have to be clear about priorities when we're using public re resources to enforce the law. 819 here on AM760 Progressive Talk. All right, up next, the uh, Wall Street uh, reform bill, and I put the uh, reform in quotes because I, I have stated that I think it's, it's a little bit too weak to even be called reform, but the Wall Street reform bill uh, does include new powers for state attorneys general. Uh, what will those powers be used for here in Colorado, if anything. I'm going to ask Attorney General John Southers uh, and his Democratic opponent, Stan Garnett, the Boulder County District Attorney, about that after a traffic update with John Turk. Hey, 23 here on AM760 Progressive Talk again. In studio with us is Attorney General John Southers, the Colorado uh, Republican Attorney General, and his Democratic challenger in the, uh, in the upcoming 2010 uh, Attorney General's race, Stan Garnett, the Boulder County District Attorney. Uh, and I said before the break uh, that we're going to be discussing uh, Wall Street reform. Uh, this bill, uh, the federal bill, uh, includes... Um, provisions that deal uh, with state attorney general. And this question is for uh, Stan Garnett. The, uh, this recently passed bill allows state attorneys general uh, to bring civil actions against a national bank, for instance, in order to enforce new federal financial regulations. Um, my first question is, what do you plan to do with that power? And part of that question, uh, I want to I, I want to ask about the state deficit. Uh, if you're going to ramp up uh, the kind of consumer enforcement uh, that this new bill uh, allows you to, where specifically uh, would you cut resources in the attorney general's office right now? Would you reduce staff addressing environmental work, defense of water resources, something else? Where, if you're going to in increase enforcement using these new tools, where would the resources come from? Well, David, thanks for that question. And, and you're correct that uh, the president signed into law, I think about two weeks ago, uh, this new Financial Reform Act. Not all of it's terrific. And I know you've talked about it on your show in the past, but it does have one provision that I'm very excited about, and that's Section 1042, which does empower state attorneys general to enforce provisions of the act. Now, 
let me let me give you a little bit of context to this because I really think this is what this race is about. As I've gone around the state over the last four months since I declared my candidacy, I have heard complaint after complaint after complaint about consumer protection. People uh, have had bad experiences with mortgage companies, with nursing homes, with financial agencies, with credit card companies, and they want something, uh, somebody to do something about it. In fact, the FTC compiles um, statistics on consumer complaints, and they have steadily gone up since John Southers became Attorney General in 2005, so that per capita, Colorado, believe it or not, was the number one highest state for consumer complaints in 2008, and number two out of the entire country. So this is a huge problem. When I set up the Boulder DA's office staff, when I took over a year and a half ago, first thing I did was put together a very uh, vigorous consumer protection unit. We have tons of cases. We have a lot of issues we have to address. This is an issue that the state must deal with. John, in the past, has indicated that he thinks that the consumer protection powers of state attorneys general should be scaled back. In a speech in uh, 2007 to the Federalist Society, he said that uh, the legislature should take steps to curb consumer protection power. I believe exactly the opposite. I think Coloradans deserve an attorney general who is aggressive, who's proactive, and who uses the power in both state and federal statutes to go to bat for them with uh, financial institutions and others that take advantage of them. So it will be a top priority when I'm attorney general. It's not now. It never has been for John Southers. And there's a lot that we need to do, as indicated by this. Now, in terms of how I'll get there, um, I have studied the attorney general staffs of quite a number of attorney generals across the country. We currently in our office have a, er, in, under John's leadership, have a skeletal sk uh, staff handling consumer protection. What I'll do is the same thing I did in the Boulder DA's office. I'll look at every one of those 244 lawyers that work for the Colorado Attorney General. I'll look at that entire budget of $50 million. I'll make appropriate reallocation of FTE from one department to another to make sure that we have a consumer protection unit that is both skilled, and I think the guys that are there now are skilled, I think they're good lawyers, there's just not enough of them, and that we can make this a priority to really help people. That's what I hear people need. Okay, and, and, and I wanna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let uh, Attorney General Southers respond, but, but you, you mentioned uh, this speech uh, that Attorney General Southers gave. I want to I play this question, uh, this, this, uh, a clip from this, uh, and then I want, I want your response. Uh, you recently, Attorney General Southers, gave a speech uh, uh, deriding what you called uh, Attorney General activism on consumer issues. Here's a clip from that speech. I believe the only effective remedy for AG activism is action by the state legislatures to statutorily curb it. Uh, they could do so by curbing the nature and scope of AG consumer protection powers. Okay, and now considering this call to curb the nature and scope of AG consumer protection powers, my question for you is do you support the financial regulatory reform bills increase in those powers? If not, why not? If so, are you planning to use those new powers despite those past comments? David, I appreciate your question, but we have a problem here. Stan didn't answer your initial question. He went off on uh, my performance in consumer protection. Can I respond to that and Go then ahead. talk about it? Okay. First of all, Stan, to this day, doesn't understand the Attorney General's budget situation. The vast majority of our budget uh, is not general fund. It's appropriations that the departments go to to get legal services. Out of our $50 million bu budget, $42 million is the departments uh, getting an appropriation for legal services that they then purchase from the AG's office on an hourly basis. That money is not available for consumer protection. Uh, only general fund dollars, which fund consumer protection, uh, criminal justice, uh, water rights, uh, and CERCLA. So there is no more general fund money to dramatically expand the uh, consumer protection division, like you say. Uh, we have had some expansion over the last several years through, for example, when we set up uh, the regulation of mortgage brokers. We got fees in and hired uh, mortgage fraud investigators in consumer protection. Um, we have been incredibly aggressive in the consumer protection area, filed more actions uh, than at any time in the history of the state. What I'm referring to there uh, is that unlike Colorado, which has a very specific Consumer Protection Act with delineated deceptive trade practices, which is, I think is the very appropriate way to do it, several states have what they call many FTC acts, which just say allow the uh, attorney general to go on after anything they think is unconscionable. 
Uh, that has resulted in some cases and the use of non-statutory vehicles by attorney generals that I think is very problematic. We had California suing the automobile industry, saying that cars uh, are uh, public nuisances, despite the manufacturer's compliance with EPA and California environmental regulations. We had uh, Elliot Spitzer uh, suing uh, the New York Stock Exchange, a private entity, saying they're paying too much money. There was no statutory vehicle for that. And in fact, he was long out of the governor's office before the case was finally dismissed. Well, then, then let's take it, let's take it, uh, let's step back from that and then ask the question, because uh, if you are advising the legislature uh, and the legislature comes to you after this financial meltdown and says to you as the attorney general, uh, we think that you should have more power uh, like the federal bill, more power to go after, for instance, financial institutions. We actually want to give you more power uh, for you uh, at your discretion. Uh, are you saying that that would be a something that that a kind of power that you wouldn't want? And what about the powers in this federal bill? No, it's up to the legislature as a matter of public policy to decide what powers uh, we ought to have. I'm just saying we ought to stick with those powers. We shouldn't uh, understood. But I think powers. a lot of people. Now, yeah. Let me talk about the federal bill. Let's answer that question. Uh, January 14th of last year, I testified in front of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, myself and Lisa Madigan, uh, who was the Democrat, I was the Republican, she's the Attorney General of Illinois, testified before the Inquiry Commission. We both made the point that we believe that federal preemption, uh, particularly by the Office of the Controller of the Currency, that told state attorney generals, you have no business investigating federally chartered institutions, uh, at a point in time when the states were on to some of the abuses in the subprime market long before the feds were, their preemption, preemption prevented us from getting at some of the problems early on. That w a group of AGs met with President Obama in March, and we urged him to put into this bill as little federal preemption as possible, and he did. Uh, the bill sets up two large commissions. This is a very large bureaucracy, but two large commissions. The Consumer Financial Protection uh, Bureau is a consolidation of a lot of consumer protect, uh, protection powers uh, into one agency. For the first time in history, it will have jurisdiction over both state chartered and federally chartered institutions. Now, this bureau, which is not set up yet, will be set up in the next several months, will then promulgate rules which will define unfair, deceptive acts and practices and mandate certain disclosures. Essentially, what I see happening is that this board will establish the equivalent of uh, deceptive trade practices on the federal level. The AGs will have the power to enforce those rules as long as they don't discriminate against federal charter institutions uh, as opposed to state chartered institutions. And it sounds like you support that. Uh, I do. To the extent that it's passed, uh, it's part of the law. And it gives me specific enforcement powers. I don't have any problem with that. My problem, and what I refer to as this activism, is when AGs decide to uh, enforce public policy by regulation through litigation, even though the legislature hasn't sanctioned that approach. If the legislature gives me the powers, whether it be Congress or the state legislature, I will enforce the law aggressively. Okay, and we're going to get to a, to a discussion about that very issue, what kinds of discretion an attorney general has. But I just, before we get to a, to a break, I just want to allow Stan Garnett uh, to respond to what we've been discussing here. Go ahead. Thanks, David. And, and I, I appreciate the chance to respond to this, uh, this uh, point that John makes that somehow I don't understand the budget, because what it really does is highlight the difference in our backgrounds. You know, I spent 22 years in private, in the private sector before I became the district attorney in Boulder. John, is, John and I have been lawyers about the same amount of time. Virtually all of his career has been as a government lawyer. This is an issue of management. It's an issue of leadership. Before I became the district attorney in Boulder, I had innumerable people tell me that the changes I had in mind for that office could not be done, the budget couldn't be moved around, it couldn't be handled. When you're in the private sector, you have to be accountable, you have to be focused, you have to be clear, and you have to be creative. I learned that the hard way on 17th Street for 22 years. That's what I brought to the DA's office. That's what I'm going to bring to the Attorney General's office, and that's how I will, I can assure you of two things. One, I will dramatically increase the consumer protection capacity of that office, and two, I will save money, I will save taxpayer money doing it. 
835 here on AM 760 Progressive Talk. All right, up next, we're going to get into uh, the issue uh, that drew a lot of headlines to the Attorney General's office. Uh, Colorado's uh, signing on to a suit against, a federal suit uh, against President Obama's health care bill. We're going to get into a discussion of why that happened. Uh, dis- it's really a debate over what states' rights uh, and local control uh, is and is not. So stick around for that. We'll get to it after a traffic update with John Turk. Thirty-nine here on AM seven sixty Progressive Talk again in studio with us is Colorado Attorney General uh, John Southers, the Republican, and his Democratic challenger, uh, Boulder County District Attorney Stan Garnett. This is a pretty contested uh, race, very contested race. We've had a uh, discussion about marijuana. Uh, we've had a discussion about the new powers that state attorneys general get uh, in the financial regulatory reform bill, consumer protection in general. We're going to move now uh, to the issue of states' rights, the president's health care bill, uh, the legal responsibilities of the office. And I want to, before we get to health care, I want to ask Stan Garnett this question. We just heard uh, Attorney General John Southers talk about um, uh, enforcing the laws that are on the books, uh, that the legislature passes, defending laws uh, that uh, that perhaps uh, an, an individual attorney general uh, may not personally support. And I want to play some clips for you. For you. On June 22nd, uh, you, Stan Garnett, were asked about Arizona's new immigration law and the prospect of it coming to Colorado as Republican gubernatorial candidate Scott McGinnis has proposed. Now, in opposing that effort, here is uh, what you said. If that law does pass, uh, my duties as attorney general uh, would be to defend the laws of Colorado unless I believe that they are so completely unsupportable and indefensible that it would be unethical for me to take that position. And you also said this. I would not pursue the defense of anything I felt I ethically couldn't defend. Okay, so the question uh, is, and this is a, a really a philosophical question, but of course it relates to the Arizona law, uh, if you are, you're willing to defend a law, quote, unless you believe that they are completely unsupportable in your opinion or unethical, does the Arizona law, if it came to Colorado, fit that description in your mind? And then more generally, uh, why do you believe that if you're elected Colorado attorney general, you aren't necessarily obligated uh, to enforce and defend laws uh, that the legislature passes that you may disagree with? Well, David, that's a good question, and that has to do really with the role of what an attorney does and with the role of what the Colorado Attorney General's uh, function is in the state government. You know, in, in my 22 years in private practice, I many times represented clients on issues that I personally didn't believe in. I didn't agree with their position. I didn't think it was correct. It wasn't the position I would have taken, but legally it was a defensible position. It was my obligation to come into court and to assert the position uh, for my client and, and see if I could be successful in that. That's what lawyers do. Uh, the, obli- the, the limitation on that under the law is that I can never be in a position to um, assert a position in court that I think under the rules uh, applicable to lawyers is not legally or ethically defensible. And I never did that in my years of private practice. I've never done it as a prosecutor. I've been a prosecutor now uh, six years. Uh, I've never done it in either context. As attorney general, uh, the people of Colorado are entitled to an attorney general who will defend the laws of the state as they're passed, as they are enacted by the legislature or by the people through the referendum or petition process. And I will do that unless I personally conclude that ethically I cannot assert the position I would have to be required to assert to be able to defend that law. I think that would be very rare. I think that it's, uh, uh, from what I know of the Arizona law, even though it's been held to be unconstitutional, I, I, th- I think if that law was actually passed in Colorado, I would be able to ethically assert whatever position I needed to in any litigation in court in Colorado. Uh, in, the, in the same uh, speech that you took that clip from, we talked about Amendment 2. Amendment 2 was an issue in which I know that Governor Romer uh, was uncomfortable with the policy that Amendment 2 was putting forward, but still felt it was appropriate for the state of Colorado to defend the law. So I think it's rare when an attorney general would not actually defend a position in court. doesn't mean that I won't uh, use the position of attorney general to lobby the legislature where I think it's appropriate, just like John does and has done repeatedly, particularly on marijuana issues. Uh, I'll state what I think the law should be. But then once the laws are passed, it'll be my job to defend them. Uh, and, and Attorney General Southers, I, 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 if you can respond quickly, because I want to get to the to the health care issue, if you have anything to add. Uh, Stan's pretty close to correct. I think the Attorney General has responsibility to defend any law unless the Attorney General concludes that it is indefensible. 
Uh, and the Colorado law is geared for that. Uh, there's a provision in the law that if the attorney general indicates to the governor that they believe a law is in, indefensible, the governor thinks it's not, the governor can appoint uh, counsel to do it. Uh, this is not a theoretical question. Um, uh, Stan and I, ag- I think, agreed that certain aspects of the Arizona uh, law weren't going to make it, those that created new crimes. But interestingly enough, Judge Bolton uh, held invalid uh, the provision about arresting and holding people for immigration authorities. Colorado has a law very close to that, 29-29-103, says a peace officer who has probable cause that an arrestee for criminal offense is not legally present in the United States shall report such arrestee to the United States Immigration Customs Enforcement Office. If a county sheriff has reasonable belief that an arrestee is not legally present in the United States, the sheriff shall report that. Um, there's certain language that Judge Bolton used that I think may cause this uh, to be in question. I don't think that interferes with federal preemption in this area. It doesn't require the feds to do anything. It just requires the state to report it. Uh, I will be very prepared to defend this provision under Colorado law. All right, let's turn to health care because this has made a, a lot of headlines. Uh, and this is a question for Attorney General John Southers. As Attorney General, you added Colorado to the list of states filing a lawsuit against the Obama administration's health care bill, saying the legislation uh, effectively is an unconstitutional violation of states' rights under the Tenth Amendment. Now, by that legal argument, I want to know if you oppose the Supreme Court's recent ruling that says states and cities, for instance, uh, do not have a right uh, to effectively regulate firearms. Do you oppose, for instance, a recent federal court ruling against the Defense of Marriage Act, which says the federal government's refusal to recognize same-sex marriages recognized by states is unconstitutional? And then, of course, what about immigration? Does a state like Arizona have the constitutional right to criminalize uh, someone's immigration status? I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to get at how you define define states' rights if you think that the uh, federal health care bill was an assault on that, uh, isn't the Supreme Court, and those examples that I've given you, aren't those also an assault? Uh, Absolutely not. You have to look at the Constitution, which defines the powers that the federal government has, uh, very enumerated powers, and by its expressed term says all powers not specifically given to the federal government in the Constitution are reserved to the states. In the case of the Second Amendment, once the Supreme Court found that it was an individual right, Uh, it was very clear that they were going to make that provision of the Bill of Rights uh, applicable to the states because most of the other provisions of the Bill of Rights are applicable to states through the 14th Amendment, uh, which says states shall not deprive citizens of due process. Gradually, the Supreme Court has incorporated the Bill of Rights into the 14th Amendment, made them applicable to the states. Now, is it fair to say you support that Supreme Court decision on firearms? Absolutely. I filed an amicus brief in support of it, as did 38 states, including 22 Democrats, including Jerry Brown and California and everything. Because once they made the first decision, uh, the other one was pretty much of a no-brainer. But this dichotomy between the health care and the immigration is a great example of enumerated powers. Uh, Article 1, Section 8, which enumerates the powers of the federal government, gives the federal government the power to... uh, establish a uniform process of naturalization. The courts have said naturalization and immigration. So they have an enumerated power there. There is no health care enumerated power. So the federal government, at least Congress, was basing the individual health insurance mandate on the commerce power. Uh, Interestingly enough, in response to our suit and suit by Virginia, the Department of Justice has abandoned the commerce power uh, argument and said, no, we're basing it on the taxing power. Uh, But here's the question. Uh, Is there anything in the taxing power or the commerce power that would allow the federal government to punish an individual's economic inactivity, their failure to buy a product or service? There was a huge decision yesterday uh, relevant to this because Virginia, who had filed a separate case uh, against the individual health insurance mandate, a federal uh, federal district Uh, court in Virginia yesterday denied the federal government's motion to dismiss. Here's what they said. The essence, the essential question is whether or not Congress has the right to regulate and tax the citizen's decision not to participate in interstate commerce. Contrary to the assertion of Stan and a lot of other people, the court goes on to say there is no reported precedent in any federal appellate court that has extended the Commerce Clause or the Taxing Clause to allow Congress to regulate a person's decision not to purchase a particular product or service. That's what this case is about. The court, this court said this is unprecedented. 
All right, let me let me let me let Stan Garnett r respond. And I want to say this very clearly because I've said it before. I am I was not a fan of the individual health care mandate. Uh, it seems to me that we hear Attorney General Southers saying that that is the specific part of this that he thinks is not uh, constitutional. That's that's the specific part of this that he believes uh, violates that the essential principle of states' rights. What is your response to that? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of issues bouncing around um, with this topic. So let me try to bring a little focus to him. First of all, with regard to the ruling yesterday. That was a very preliminary ruling in a case that was not the case that John put the state of Colorado into, the Virginia case. Simply a ruling by the court that the case can move to the next stage. So let's not be, con I mean, it's a very routine, early ruling in a complex piece of litigation, the kind of thing that uh, all of us who do complex litigation deal with all the time. Secondly, I have been very clear ever since John joined this lawsuit about how wrong I think it is for him to uh, take the authority and the prestige of the Colorado Attorney General's office in the state of Colorado and put them as a party in a lawsuit in Florida that is partisan, that's obstructionist, and that's based on a very weak legal theory. Now, I could talk, and I have in other, in other contexts, for about an hour about the history of this issue. Let me try to be very, very concise. Since the beginning of the American experiment, the issue of how much is a states' rights issue and how much is a federal issue has been over and over again resolved. And as I'd like to point out initially by Andrew Jackson in 1832 in the nullification crisis, every step forward in American history, uh, whether it's been civil rights, whether it's been Medicare, whether it's been Medicaid, whether it's been uh, efforts to uh, improve people's lot has been opposed for the same basis that John's opposing uh, this healthcare plan. It's wrong. It's based on a bad legal theory. Uh, it will fail eventually. 851 here on AM 760 Progressive Talk. All right, we're going to come back and we'll, we'll let Attorney General Southers respond to that. I also, I have to get to the issue uh, of criminal justice policy, criminal justice reform, uh, the death penalty. It's an important, important issue. It was an important issue in the Colorado State Legislature. So stick around after a traffic update with John Turk. Eight fifty four here on AM seven sixty Progressive Talk. Very quickly, we just want to finish up our discussion about the health care issue. Stan Garnett, uh, Boulder County D DA, thirty seconds. You wanted to complete one more point. Thanks, David. The point I was going to make is that health care lawsuit, which I could talk about the rest of the day. I won't. Is is consistent with a whole series of partisan litigations that John has gotten into, uh, opposing gay rights, dealing with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, dealing with the Massey Coal Company, dealing with handguns across the country that are a distraction and keep him from doing the job that the Coloradans elected him to do, particularly in consumer protection. Attorney General I, I was elected to preserve uh, Coloradans' constitutional rights, and I'm going to continue to do that. Stan's what I call a co coercive utopian. If what the federal government wants to do is a good thing, doesn't matter how they do it. It matters a lot how they do it. We have to preserve federalism and protect our individual constitutional rights. Okay, we're going to move to our last subject, uh, and this question is for uh, Attorney General John Southers. During the last legislative session, lawmakers came within a few votes of repealing Colorado's death penalty and putting the money saved into efforts to solve more than 1,500 unsolved homicides in Colorado. Lawmakers pushing the bill said this would be a better use of resources during a budget crunch, crunch and some pointed out the potential racism in the death penalty's application. A recent study uh, said that uh, uh, the c people convicted of killing a white person is three times more likely to be given the death penalty than someone convicted of killing a black person. Uh, in an era of budget cuts, questions about unequal uh, prosecutions, and census data that shows states have that have repealed the death penalty have a far lower murder rate than states that have a death penalty. Uh, where do you come down on the death penalty? Uh, do you support uh, uh, taking the money that would be saved from ending the death penalty and putting it into trying to solve those unsolved murders? Uh, I support retaining the death penalty in Colorado. Based on my 33 years of experience in the system, there are just certain crimes for which life in prison is not an adequate societal response. And we've had a couple of them in Colorado, where people facing life in prison on a murder charge have gone out and killed the witnesses against them. If you don't have a death penalty in a case like that, uh, you can get no greater consequence for killing witnesses than you are otherwise going to face. Same thing if you kill someone in prison when you're in there uh, for first-degree murder. I think the certain terrorism crimes... Uh, we need to have a greater societal response than life in prison. Uh, I think these are two separate issues. I do think we ought to invest money in uh, cold uh, cases, but uh, the opponents of the death penalty have dragged these folks in, and they're, they're two different issues. We ought to retain the death penalty, and we ought to do everything we can uh, on a state and local police department basis uh, to do a better job of uh, solving cold crimes. Stan Garnett, your response. 
Well, first of all, I totally agree with John that solving cold uh, homicides is very important. It's, it's been one of my priorities in Boulder. Uh, we, in fact, were recently recognized for closing out eight cold homicide cases that had uh, been cold for quite some time in Boulder. I'm very proud of that. And the peace that it brings to the victims' families is very significant. The death penalty in Colorado is largely um, irrelevant to day-to-day enforcement, law enforcement. We, ha- we, <clears throat> we have life without parole. Life without parole is a very severe consequence for first-degree murder. Uh, death, the death penalty is rarely sought. Uh, we've only executed one person in the last 40 years. One of the reasons it's rarely sought is it's very expensive, it's very cumbersome, and it's very difficult to impose. I don't uh, advocate repealing it, but it's rarely used in Colorado. Well, very, very quickly, would you have lobbied uh, the legislature to not repeal the death penalty? Would I have lobbied them to not? No, I would have let the legislature make that decision. I don't think it's important enough for the attorney general to get involved in lobbying on that issue. The legislature can figure that out. 858 here on AM 760 Progressive Talk. That's our debate uh, in the attorney general's race. I want to thank both of you. Attorney General John Southers, thank Thank you you for for being here. Stan Garnett, thank you for being here. here. And you can uh, find the podcast of this debate. It'll be on our website at uh, am760.net. Again, thank you to both of the candidates. And we want to help voters make an informed decision in this race. Up next, Media Matters, uh, the latest in the right-wing media. Stick around.